So do you have your Tanakh open? Besedel, yes. Okay, go to Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. Read it slowly for us. May the angel who redeemed me from all harm bless the youth. Now, may is the verb called... bless, is the verb bless singular or plural? You know Hebrew, right? Is it singular. Okay, who's blessing the grandchildren? The angel or God? It says Amalek, so it would be here. And if you read the text of Christ, it would be the angel. Okay, but in 15, he mentioned the God before whom my fathers walked, the God who fed me all the days of my life. So who exactly is blessing them? Is a, I mean, it would be God as well. However, but how can uh, you have can... God and the angel blessing if the verb is singular? So God and the angel are one? Not necessarily, no. Okay, explain how then this is a prayer, and he's praying to God, but then he mentions the angel, mm -hmm. and the verb to bless is singular. How do you get a singular verb? When you mention God and the angel and this prayer to bless his grandchildren, if the angel is not somehow connected to God, please explain to me. Well, I mean, necessarily, the thing is in the Tanakh, right? There are various uh, essentially forms, you know, of angels. So when you see, like, you know, the word the Amal of Hashem, in the angel Lord, yeah. it not only is simply, uh, I'll start, I'm starting from the beginning here, right? It's not only uh, necessarily like a physical, uh, you know, angel with a physical appearance coming down from the heavens and with wings, but it can also be something that's supernatural that happens, uh, you know. And uh, this is a prayer, actions. right? Now you're going on a tangent because well, no, a one said, no one well, said, no one said that Malach well, cannot refer to spirit beings that appear in physical well, form. Well, well, that's not my question. You went on well, a tangent. A okay. uh, I will answer. So you went a on a tangent. Right? Here is a prayer. Yeah, it says, He's invoking the angel that redeemed him. Don't tap dance around that. Redeemed him. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is a specific angel that has accompanied Yaakov and has saved him from his calamities. And he's praying to him to bless his grandchildren. But he prays to him right after mentioning God before Abraham and Isaac walked and God who fed me. Let me let me put it this way so you can see how this gets you in trouble. You so-called mm -hmm. Jews who believe in the oneness of God, like the Muslims do. Do you today, would you pray to the Malach to bless your children if you had any or grandchildren? No. Say it again? No. So then you're not, not like Jacob. That means Jacob would condemn you because he did pray to an angel. Well, yeah, and if you want to understand the interpretation of this verse, we view here it says Amalek Goel essentially means that you know either yeah. means two things: the and redeemer Goel, right? or the redeemer. Kinsman redeemer, right? Um, of course. So okay. let me, uh, I'll explain though. So it essentially is, you know, more, you know, of a metaphor, for example. So for we can see in uh, Genesis, you know, uh, chapter 31, verses 11 to 13. No, that he actually also proves says, my point, not wait, yours. Wait, on. Genesis well, 31 is the next verse I was going to go to. It proves my point, not yours. Because then again, that angel who's been accompanying him and saving him, the angel says, I'm the God of Bethel. Do you believe an angel can say I'm the God of Bethel, the house of God? That actually backfired against you. That was the next verse I was going to. I believe. Well, uh, I was going to explain. This is why I was explaining the Judaism's view of what the what the angel of the Lord is. And firstly, I want to say we believe the reason why he is saying, you know, the angel is the redeemer, correct, is because of the fact that he is ascribing essentially the actions of God on earth to the angel, and that's what we all essentially. That is what we believe generally about many uh, different passages in the Tanakh that use the word angel of the Lord. Okay. We believe the same thing for here as well. That essentially Hamalach Goel, right? Is who is the Hamalach is who then? Is the Malach is the Malach is referring to God. However, so the Malach is God. Referring. Good, excellent. Thank you. No, no. What I wasn't finished. The Malach is essentially not co-eternal with God. Is my uh, point. Show me where and it says it's not co-eternal. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you can prove. I don't care what Judaism believes. I care what you can prove from Scripture. I, you just read so I'm much into the text. Show me this Malach is not eternal. Show me where it says he's created. Well, I didn't necessarily say it was created, but it also doesn't say that he's necessarily... Yes, it does. When he says know, he's the God of Bethel, and Jacob prays to him, and then God says, mm -hmm. my name is in him, you don't get any clearer proof that this angel cannot be a creature if he's the God of Bethel, and you can pray to him. And then in Exodus 23, go to Exodus 23, 20 to 21. I don't mm -hmm. care what Judaism says. I care what Judaism proves. Don't give me your personal beliefs. Prove it to me from Scripture. Your well, Scripture, I, was... I haven't even used the New Testament. And don't tell me what you think it means. Deal with the grammar and the syntax, because you mm -hmm. say you know Hebrew. So go to Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Behold, I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Beware of him and obey him. Do not rebel against him, for he will not forgive your transgression, for my name is within him. My name is what? Within him. So do you believe, you do you believe that God's name can be embodied by a creature so that he can do what God does, forgive sins, because he warned them. Be careful of this angel. He won't forgive you, and he explains why, for my name is in him. So a creature can do what God does, forgive sins, because he embodies the name of God. And more importantly, what does name mean according to the Hebrew? When you speak of the name of God, what are you saying? Well, you can say, you know, name as in referring to God, of course. Okay, so he says, my, my essence is embodied in Thank you. I'm glad you admit that. So because I... I do want to say, though, yes. there is a translation error here, and I don't know why they translated this, but right? 
is common is most commonly used as you know close to him. So, for example, you know, when you are doing the, you know, uh, when you're doing the process, right, yeah. of bringing somebody close to you, or for example, when you know, uh, yeah, bringing somebody close to you, yeah, you'd say I need metarev, right? Yeah. Metarev, you know, means to bring close. It's the same example here. Uh, not it doesn't necessarily mean. Okay, you know, notice you said does not necessarily mean. So that means it can mean that, but you don't want it to mean that because unless you're going to say it never means no. that, then I'm going to call your lie out. I want you to well, admit no, it can mean I that, right? Remember. Well, I didn't say never. But okay, I was so let's going see, listen. You'll see. See what you're doing again. Notice the tap dance. You admit that it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it can mean that. Since it can mean that, why are you not bringing up something irrelevant? Because the text is clear. It's not my name is close to him. It has to mean my name is in him because he explains the reason why he forgives sins is my name is in him. So let's stop trying to appeal to Hebrew grammar I, as if this is going to help your case. Well, you asked me to observe the grammar. Yeah. So what and I'm can it grammatically? Let's true. make it clear, Yossi. Can it grammatically mean my name is in him? Yes or no? I mean, not necessarily. Because no. if you were when you say, say not necessarily, him, you could say okay. What I want you to do right now, give me every time that construction is used throughout the Tanakh, and show me places where it doesn't mean in him. Can you do that? Show me that construction. Where it doesn't where, where it doesn't or does? Where it doesn't mean in him. Uh, for your argument to mean every single time I want to see this construction used, every single time to show me where it doesn't mean in him. Because if you can show me it does mean in him, that means you brought up another irrelevant point, a red herring. So let's deal with the passage as it is. Because what translation did you just read? As a, as a Chabad. However, okay, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, don't talk too fast. Calm down, breathe. Chabad is an Orthodox Jewish translation. So these dumb, mm -hmm. stupid rabbis didn't know that the word should have meant my name is close to him, but they rendered my name is in him. No, not necessarily. I was going to explain those. So the reason uh, there are many problems with Chabad's translation. Now, Chabad okay, is can well, you give me a translation you like so I can stick with a translation like so we don't play the games of grammar? What translation do you like? Well, we can still use Chabad if you okay. want to dismiss this point for now. That's fine. Okay, so let's but, stick uh, with the point. This angel embodies God's name, which means he can forgive sins. So look, can you go to Zechariah no. 3 now? Can you go to, well, I'm going to show you that he forgives sins, that you have problems with this angel because he's a nightmare for you and your rabbis. Go to Zechariah 3 and read verses 3 and 4. Now, Joshua was wearing filthy garments and standing before the angel, and he, you know, in parentheses, the angel, raised his voice and said to those standing before him, saying, take the filthy garments off him. And he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. And I have clad them, I have clad you cl with clean garments. Wow. The angel says, remove his filthy garments. And then the angel says to Joshua, I removed your what from you? Read verse 4 again. What did he remove? Your iniquity. Oh, okay. So the, and this is a heavenly vision that Zechariah is saying. So mm -hmm. the angel in heaven removes the sins of Joshua, forgives him of his sins, and clothes him with pure garments. And he still want to convince me the angel is not God because he does what only God does, and he's doing it in heaven. Convince me. That he's not God. This is in heaven? Yes, because it's not on earth. It's not on earth, dude. Because if you read verses 1 and 2, he's having a vision where he sees the angel of the Lord, Shatan, uh, mm. Satan, and Joshua. So please, I hope we don't have to play that game. This is a heavenly vision. Even if it's not mm. heavenly vision. Let's put that aside. The angel is the one commanding other angels and saying, I removed your sin. I removed your sin. Which is exactly what God said in Exodus 23. The angel can and cannot do. Meaning he can forgive his sins or he won't. Not cannot do, meaning he doesn't have the ability. Meaning either mm -hmm. he will forgive you or choose to condemn you. So don't get him angry because my name is in him. So again, I'm going to ask you this question so we can make it very simple and beautiful from your Tanakh. Is there someone other than God who forgives and removes sins? No. Okay, say it again. However. Well, well, well done. Say it no. again. There's nobody but God. Okay. That's a... Explain to me Exodus, now Exodus 23, 21 and Zechariah 3, 4, where the angel does actually forgive sins and God says he can. You just said only God can do that. Now, please convince me that your Judaism has not distorted the Tanakh to deny that this angel is divine and he's a thing from God, but one with him. Well, so for example, we can firstly, I will finish my point that I was Go making prior point, to uh, Genesis. Uh, hold on. It was a uh, Genesis uh, chapter. Sorry. Uh, hold on. 31, 10 to 13. 31, thank you, thank you, yes, yes, yes. My point was, right, essentially de Kilbon, right, uh, I demonstrated that it can also mean, you know, clo you know close to him as well. It does yeah, not necessarily mean in him. And However, it can as well, I do want to say, it can mean both. I do. That's a good idea. I do want to say as well, though, is that essentially we can see throughout the entirety of the Tanakh yeah. 
that God uses angels, okay, as a you know by you know as a means of a you know doing his you know as a means of a you know medium essentially to interact with uh, you know the you know, interact with his you know people interacting you know, with the sons of Adam on earth. Okay. Now we know this because we can see you know for example the angel of the Lord wrestled you know wrestled Jacob. There was an angel. Uh, you're you're getting begging questions. You're going too fast. No, Genesis 32 does not prove your case because it's one specific angel who is called God because he is God. You're assuming this is referring to angels in general. I know what you're referring to. Genesis 32, 24 to 30, mm. cross-reference with Hosea 12, 2 to 5. I guarantee you'll see none of them support you. They support me, and I'll get to them. So don't keep bringing passages. It's going to backfire against you. Let's just stick with I... Genesis 31. Wait, hold on. Just stick with Genesis 31. Read for me 31 verse 13. Read it for me what the angel says, because we know it's the angel in verse 11, right? So, you know, I don't need to prove that to you. What did he say to Jacob when Lebanon is persecuting? I've seen your affliction because I'm what? It says, I, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a monument, where you pronounced me, uh, where you pronounced to me a vow. Now arise, go forth from this land and return to the land of your birth. Okay, now, who said in verse 13, I am the God of Bethel? Who's that speaking? And it says in verse 11, which means, and an angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. Slowly repeat the phrase, Malachu, slowly. Yeah. Malach Elohim, right? You said Kim because you don't mm -hmm. pronounce Elohim. All right, okay, that's fine. All right, now go to Genesis 35, verse 1, because I want you to explain because you say Elohim, so you won't say Elohim. But I hope you don't mind me saying Elohim. I don't follow that tradition, but you do. Anyway, in Genesis mm -hmm. 35, verse 1, yeah. read it slowly for me because God is telling Jacob to go to Bethel again. Bethel, Beth El, the same place mm -hmm. where the angel said, I am the God of the house of God, where he anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now, in Genesis 35, verse 1, read it slowly for me. And God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and abide there and make there an altar to uh, to the God who appeared to you to who fled from your brother Esau. Slowly. God, God said to him, Go to Bethel and make an altar to who? To the God who appeared to you. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to let you look at the Hebrew grammar to confirm my point. Why is God saying to Jacob, When you go to Bethel, you build an altar to the God who appeared to you? Why didn't he simply say, Hey, when you go to Bethel, build an altar to me who appeared to you? Why is he speaking of God in the third person? And can you confirm the Hebrew's difference? It's Elohim. Elohim said to him, we want to say Elohim, build an altar to Il, El. The Hebrew mm -hmm. words are different, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, well, well before you say well, no, I don't give me an example because in verse 7, now read for me verse 7. So then you can give me your response. But first now read verse 7. So I can sum it up and I'll let you give your explanation. He built there an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, yes. for, the, uh, for there God had been revealed to him when he fled from before his brother Esau. Now, confirm to everyone here, the verb revealed to him. It's plural, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. So wait, say it again. That when it says God revealed to him, it's plural, right? Mm -hmm. Literally, it's yes. Elohim when they revealed themselves to him. Literally, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's good. So, so far as the people don't think I'm making it up. Now, do you want more proof that the angel himself is God, which accounts for why it says God, they reveal themselves to Jacob? Because you have Elohim speaking of Il, the Il who appeared to Jacob at Beth Il, and that Il is the angel of God. So you have God and the angel together being called Elohim, which is why it's plural. Elohim, they reveal themselves to him. Why is it plural? Well, because of the fact uh, is that we can see, so for example, in uh, you know Genesis uh, 39 verse 20 as well, it says, you know, Joseph's master, and the word is Idonai, says Idonai. We're not talking about and, proper names. I know the difference well, between Elohim. We're talking about uh, participles and verbs. Show me an example in the Hebrew Bible where you have participles, verbs, adjectives that are plural and referring to a singular subject. Don't give me proper names, Adonenu or Adonim. I know this. I'm talking about verbs. I'm talking about adjectives. I'm talking about participles. Can you show me an example where verbs that are plural are employed for singular persons? Um, I don't have any examples Good. off the top of my head right now. And you won't, you won't have any. You, I will. You won't have any. I'm telling you, you won't have mm -hmm. any. Now go to Isaiah 54, verse 5. And it says, For your master is your maker, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, shall be called the God of all earth. Okay, now, when it says the Lord of hosts is his name, is his name, that's singular, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but now I want you to be honest, because so far you've been honest, and I appreciate that. Can you now confirm where it says your master is your husband? I'm sorry, your maker is your husband. Those are plural participles. It's the plural of Asa and Baal. No. Yes, it is. 
I have the Hebrew lexicon. I have the internet in front of me. Please don't co contradict me. I have it right here. Well, it says Baalaych. Right? Okay, Baalaych. Oh, that's the plural of Baal. Okay, so I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but say it again. Am I right again? Wait, wait, wait. Am I right? It's plural? Yes. And is the yes, word yes. maker plural? Is the word maker plural? So I see. Yes. Okay, so now I want, so that I got you on record when you go join the Muslims and then I join them to school you that you join mm -hmm. them against Christians. I want everyone to make sure they heard you. It's plural. It's literally your makers are your husbands. The Lord of hosts is his name. Why are mm -hmm. two plural participles used for your God? They're plural participles. Don't tell me their names. They're not. They're participles. Mm -hmm. Why are plurals used for your God if your God is only one person? Well, what was the... Uh, we, we, we were reading Genesis 35. And there it says, uh, Niglu. They revealed themselves to, to Jacob because the day is God mm -hmm. and the Malach. Both of them are God. Yes. Okay, so but I'm well, showing you the pattern here because even in Isaiah 63, the angel shows up again. Ah... Mm -hmm. Let's go to Isaiah 16. But before I go to that, can you go to Isaiah 43, verse 11? I, I am the Lord. It says, Anoichi Hashem. And it says, you know, I, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. Okay, so how many saviors does Israel have? One. Okay, go to Isaiah 63, 7 to 9. The kind acts of the Lord, I will mention the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord bestowed upon us, and much a good we have to... Much good to the house of Israel, which he bestowed upon them, and according to his mercies, and according to his many kind acts. And then he said, but, they're, but they are but my people and children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior. Slowly, slowly, you know? not too fast. They be, he became their savior because they have no other savior besides Hashem, like you would say, right? Okay, now read. Well, I do, actually, I do want to point this out, though. There was, hold on, sorry, my, my screen keeps going. Well, sorry, all right. So the word used, right, is Vayahi. All right, and he says, and he says, you know, he became the savior, and he says, Vayahi lo hem ni right? Yeah. What that means, Moshiach, but Vayahi is the singular uh, past tense form of, yeah. it literally means was, and he was. Yeah, I know, we're, because so now, we're talking about the time of Moses. I understand that, but that's my mm -hmm. point, because now read verse 9. In all their trouble, he did not trouble, the, uh, not trouble them, and the angel, their presence saved them. Who saved them? Wait, 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 who saved them? Angel. Uh, Louder? Malach. Of his pa pane, panim, right, his face? Yes. Okay, wait, wait. The God who saved them was the God and the angel of his face. Mm -hmm. So the angel saved them? An angel, well, not, not angels. It just, my friend, please, don't do the, <laughs> It's in verse 9, and the angel of his presence saved them. Yes, necessarily. And even Moses said that in Numbers 20, verse 16, when Moses said that God has sent his angel to deliver us, Numbers 20, verse 16, yes, necessarily. So God saved them. The angel of his face saved them. But we got number three. It's not just two. Can you continue to read verse 10? Okay, sorry, okay. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Who? Uh, his, his Holy Spirit. They Shon. grieved his what? Holy Spirit. So, you know, remember, I'm not too good at math, but help me. Hashem, because you don't like to say the divine name, the Lord. The angel of his face and his Holy Spirit. Let me count. Hashem, one. The angel of his face, two. The Holy Spirit, three. By golly, that mm -hmm. sure sounds like three in one. And yet you're with Muslims attacking us Christians for being Trinitarian, thinking the Muslims are closer to you. Wow. 